Okay, man, let me greet everybody at all of our... Work. How many of y'all are ready to worship today? How many are you glad to be in the Lord's house, man? All right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, I want to greet everybody on all of our campuses and uh, all of our friends who are joining us on the live stream as well. We're glad you could be with us today. Now, if you're new at our church today, you know, Compassion is one church that meets in multiple locations from Statesboro and Rankin and Midway right here in Savannah as well. And so, man, let's just, let's just welcome all of our friends on all of our campuses. Come on, y'all. Let's give everybody a warm welcome tonight. Come on. There we go. Thank the Lord for everybody. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been in a series of messages that we're calling Wonder. And, of course, there are two ways to take that title. Uh, one is, I wonder why the church puts such a high priority on certain things. Uh, so high that we are actually devoted to doing them every time we get together. And then from another angle, wow. You know, sometimes my soul just sings with this sense of wonder because I do these things and then God shows up in my life because I do these things. So, you know, sometimes people ask, why do we take the Lord's Supper every week? You know, some churches do that. Other churches do it quarterly. Some do it monthly. Some seems like whenever the whim hits them, they do it. We do it every week here. Wonder why? Well, there's a really good reason for that. And if you stick around, we'll answer that question for you. Wonder why there are baptisms at almost every service. I've never been in a church where there were baptisms in almost every service. I remember inviting uh, somebody to our church one time who grew up in a denomination where they, where they sprinkle babies for baptism, which we do not do. And we'll talk to you about why we don't do that in a couple of weeks. But she had never seen a baptism by immersion, you know, the way people were baptized in the New Testament. And so she was sitting kind of high up in the worship center, minding her own business, when she realized, dude, there's a swimming pool in this church. And then a couple of folks walked into it and she was stunned that they were getting wet like that in a worship service. And then, man, when they baptized and put that person under the water, she about flipped out. And so she asked me afterwards, Cam, why do y'all do that? Why would anybody want to get soaking wet like that in public? And I had the opportunity to explain to her why Jesus asked every single person who has been saved since the resurrection to humble themselves and submit to baptism as a declaration of their faith in his, resignation, his resurrection and his new life uh, after the resurrection. And if, and if you're wondering, man, what's this baptism thing about? On October 16 and 20, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to talk about baptism. And if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, or if you're a follower of Jesus and you never have had the opportunity to honor him in this way that he asked to be honored, I hope you'll make your mind up to be baptized by immersion in two weeks uh, we're going to make it as easy as possible for everybody who wants to honor Jesus through this humble act of obedience to be able to do so in our worship service. And again, if you're one of these folks who, you know, you've been coming for a while and listening for a while, but you've never just crossed over the line and made that commitment to Jesus, then man, I hope you'll start praying about that. And I hope you will summon your courage. And I hope you will make that move on October 16 or 20 or even better today. I had breakfast uh, with a buddy yesterday who was talking about the sense of wonder that he still has in his life. You know, when he went from unbeliever to believer, a man was baptized immediately after putting his faith in Christ two years ago. And man, I'm telling you, when you humble yourself and you start honoring Jesus the way he asks to be honored, you will also live with a sense of wonder about how the Lord Jesus can change your life. But today... I want to address a question that is probably asked more than any other question about our weekly services. Anybody want to guess what it is? <laughs> uh, you know what? I would ask you to come up and sing that song for us, but I'm afraid you might do it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he's exactly right. Why does our church regularly talk about money? Cam, why does the church talk about money management and avoiding debt and living within your means? I mean, nobody else in our culture seems to give a rip about those things. Cam, don't you know that talking about money is offensive to people? That subject is really sensitive. Why don't you just avoid it? Anybody know what the answer to that question is? Malpractice. <laughs> Malpractice. It would be malpractice not to teach what the Bible says about managing money. Dude, we owe you that. I mean, we owe you that out of compassion. I mean, friends, the ineptitude in the American culture about handling money is epic. Did you know that the average American spends 117% of their annual income every year? 117%. 
That is a sinking ship. Anybody want to guess what the number one reason for divorce is in America? Infidelity. <laughs> That's like dead bang right there, you know? Anybody want to guess what number two is? Financial stress. Listen, people don't know what they're doing with their finances. And listen, if the Bible actually shows us ways to reduce stress and increase the favor of God on our finances, what kind of cowards would we be? I mean, if a fear of a little blowback was all it took to silence us on this issue. But you're right about one thing. Every year when we do a series of messages on wise money management, how you can manage your money in a way that will draw the blessing of God, I get nasty emails from overly verbal people <laughs> complaining about it. And if that's all the mail I got, it would be very discouraging. But that's not all the mail I get. I mean, a couple months ago, I got a message from these folks who paid off over $50,000 in debt in 23 months. Thank you, the Lord, yeah. And, and you know, they're thanking us for teaching them how to get control of their spending and experience some financial peace and freedom by managing money God's way. And then last week I heard from a young couple who's celebrating paying off $60,000 in debt in the last two years. And friends, after dragging that bag of rocks around for years, they feel a sense of wonder about being debt free. And listen, that first couple, they go to the East Campus, just chat them up about it. The other couple sits right over here. Ask them if they're thankful that they go to a church that teaches them how to master their finances instead of letting finances master them. But you know, honestly, <laughs> going, going to God's word for good money management, you know, that's just common sense. That's common sense, which ain't that common. Can I get an amen? amen? But that is common sense. That's not really the question that I think many of us are wondering about here today. Here's the real question. Why is giving such a high priority for followers of Jesus? I think that's the real question. Why is giving such a high priority for followers of Jesus? I mean, this is a question about why do we take up an offering every week? Why do we encourage people to take their hard-earned money and donate a significant portion of it for the purposes of God instead of spending it on their own purposes? I mean, why is there a giving tab on our website and on our live stream? Now, I know many of you are wondering, Kim, why is generosity such a big deal? And can I just tell you, that's a really fair question. And so today, I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about why followers of Jesus are taught to be generous. Why giving? I mean, whether you give on the app or you give in the offering boxes in the lobby or whether you give on our website is a part of every worship service. I want to talk to you about why followers of Jesus believe that giving generously to support the purposes of God is the smartest use of your money. And honestly, I just want to talk with you about why Sarah and I give and, I, and have given generously to support the purposes of God in our world for our whole married life. So let's just get at it. Here's number one. Followers of Jesus give because it's a family trait. Everybody say family trait. family trait. It's a family trait, man. You know, last week Harrison and Lindsay uh, came over to our house. Man, we had a great time. I had them grandkids working, working. I mean, pulling hoses out in the front yard, watering trees for me. I was working them. And they finally said, that's enough for us. We got to go. We want to go play somewhere. So they left us <laughs> and they went to visit some friends, right? And they had a great time playing over there. And on the way home, you know, Harrison and Lindsay rolled back by our house to pick up some of their stuff. So I walk out of the van to see the grandkids and little Jackson, our little two-year-old, is sitting in the car seat just passed out. Passed out. I'm not talking about that cute little fell asleep on the couch, you know, gradually drifted off. No, I'm talking about mouth open, holding something in one hand. <laughs> I mean, gone, right? Mid-pizza, gone. You know what I mean? And so I pointed this out to Harrison in the van, and he said, Dad, I'm telling you, the minute that boy sat down, he was gone. He played that he was out of gas. And I told Harrison, you know where he gets that from, right? You. You were exactly the same way. When you were that age, you had two speeds, wide open and stop. That was it. And you know, it's funny how you can look at a kid and you see so much of their parents in them because it's a family trait. And friends, that's true in your spiritual family as well. Man, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been adopted into the family of God and you are his daughter. You are his son. He loves you. And listen, just like spiritual DNA 
The Holy Spirit is hard at work in you to reshape you so that you have more and more of your Father in Heaven's family traits every day. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm telling you, one reason giving is such a high priority for us is because our dad's that way. Our father is a giver. I think the first Bible verse I ever learned as a kid was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's say this all together. Come on like lions, y'all. Come on. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, friends, when God looks at this world, he sees a world where most of the people are spiritually disconnected from him. They're spiritually lost. And that spiritual disconnect is what has led to all the other kinds of pain and corruption that just rage in our world. And you know, God could look at this mess and go, not my problem. Whoo, they're bringing it on themselves, which would be true. But that's just not how God's heart works. Man, we have a God who's a loving God. He's moved by the condition of our world and responds by giving the best he has to give. He sent his son Jesus to rescue us, to redeem us, to save us, because that's who he is. I mean, that's who he is. And so, friend, if you have a saving relationship with God, you are eventually going to take on more and more of his family traits. That's what the book of Romans says. In Romans 8, 29, it says, Oop. for those whom God foreknew, God knows everybody who's going to be saved. For those that God foreknew, he predestined, he predestined every saved person to be conformed to the likeness of his son so that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Man, I love the way the message translation renders this passage. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. Man, he decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as, his, as the life of his son. So the son stands first in the line of humanity that he has restored. Man, we see the original and intended shape of our lives right there in Jesus. And I'm telling you, friends, unless you stop the Holy Spirit, and you can do that, unless you stop the Holy Spirit from making you like your father, you're going to become a giver. And let me just tell you, this is why in our All In series, thousands of you stepped up to take your involvement here at Compassion to the next level. Why? Well, because just like your Father in Heaven, you decided you would give time and energy and effort, many of you for the very first time, because for the first time, you actually have a growing relationship with your Father in Heaven. I mean, this is why last weekend, we had our first graduating class from Growth Track, new crew, Team ready, signed up, signing in. I bet you didn't know this, but last year our MANA ministry, which is our food service ministry here at Henderson, and their volunteer teams prepared and delivered 4,000 meals to elderly people and shut-ins and people in need in our community. People who like to cook found a way to use that love to help people in our community in need. Imagine the difference that gift made to people in our community who might feel forgotten if it were not for that team of givers. You know, last week we got a, a thank you note from Samaritan's Purse because of the financial support that we were able to immediately give after Hurricane Dorian to fund setting up an emergency hospital in the Bahamas where people need it the most. And you know what? We didn't have to take up an offering. We didn't take up an offering here because so many of you are just like your father in heaven. You'd already given enough for us to be able to help them. Friends, followers of Jesus give money because we know it will make a difference in places that we can't personally go and show the love of Jesus. But you can financially fuel the doctors and nurses and the trained crisis teams who can. And can I just tell you, I give <laughs> because it feels good. It feel, you know, sometimes you think about giving till it hurts. I think you ought to give till it feels good. Can I get amen? amen. To, to, it feels good to bless what God is blessing in those places where it, 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 they need it the most. Friends, our Father in heaven is a giver. And when you join his family, giving is going to become a part of your heart as well because it's a family trait. Or you could just be a taker. But I never wanted to be in that classification. I think that's another family. Here's the second reason we give. We give because the leader of our lives asks us to give as an act of worship. Everybody say act of worship. 
You know, the scripture is amazingly specific about what it means to honor the Lord with generosity. And some of us think if we just give anything, man, we're being generous. And can I tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's not what the Bible teaches. Friends, the first people in the Bible to see giving as an act of worship were Adam and Eve and their sons Cain and Abel. And they were taught to give by their father in heaven in Genesis chapter 4. And literally giving has been a part of worship since the very beginning of biblical history. And then we see it a little clearer in Genesis chapter 14. You know, when Abraham gives a tithe of his income to a high priest named Melchizedek, uh, and, and that becomes kind of the standard for worshiping God all through the, the rest of the Bible. Now, now, what in the world is a tithe? I mean, if that was the standard before God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, well, shoot, we ought to talk about that a little bit. You know, the, the literal meaning of the word tithe is tenth, 10%. It's the practice of donating a tenth of your income back to God, which, let me tell you, that's significant. That is significant. Let me just demonstrate this. Let's say you have 10 $1 bills. And, man, you made this babysitting. And so you're going to give one to the Lord, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, you keep for yourself so that you can use those wise. Or let's say you're a high school kid and you got 100 bucks. You made this cutting grass this, this year, this week. And so you're going to give one, the first one. And for some reason, being the first one is really important to the Lord. You're going to give the first one to the Lord. And then one, two, three, four, five, the 90 is left for you. Or if you are an adult and you got $1,000 this week. And you made this by using your education and your training to, you know, to trade your time for money. It, it's really important to the Lord that you give the first 100 to the Lord and then one, two, three, four, five, six, the other 900, you spend wisely. Now, friends, on and on it goes. Same percentage, no matter what you make, 10% is 10%, which is why in December is always the biggest giving month of our, our year. And you wouldn't think that, would you? I mean, you'd think that December would be the worst month because that's when everybody's blowing all their money on, you know, dumb stuff they're going to regret in January. Unless you realize that many of the people in our church family don't know what they make until the end of December. They don't know until their bonuses come in and their distributions are paid. But because they're followers of Jesus and because they're committed to doing what he asks, they get their account to figure it all up. Tell me what the total is so I can give 10% of that as an act of worship. And friends, that's how God asks everybody who follows Jesus to use their money as an act of worship. Now, let me tell you a secret because this is totally counterintuitive. You would think that this stack would be the hardest to tithe, right? The ones, because there's not many of them and it doesn't represent much money. And you would be totally wrong about that. You know what the hardest one to tithe? Is the big stack. I'm telling you, the more you make, the more you want, and the harder it is to be generous with it. It's just, that's just how it works. But let me tell you, if my life was ruled by me doing what I wanted, I wouldn't give very much to the Lord because I would spend most of it on myself. But Sarah and I are Christ followers. And so what he wants is what rules our finances like everything else. And so friends, all the way you know, to the first book of the Bible, the idea of tithing is introduced to the people of God. Then in the last book in the Old Testament, we read these really familiar words. If you've been here for long, you've heard this before. Uh, Malachi said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Talk about that would be analogous to the church today. So that there will be food, you know, resources, capacity uh, in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. Only time in the Bible he ever says that. Test me, check it out. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't, have, you won't have room enough for it. Now, if you read the verses right before this in, in Malachi chapter 3 uh, or right afterwards, you'll see how God intends to throw open the windows of blessing for people who tithe. He's going to bless their work. He's going to preserve their resources. He's going to protect them, all that. And if you read the verses right before, you'll see that God considers giving less than a full tithe, stealing from him. And then in the next book, in Matthew, Jesus himself affirms tithing. He taught people not to neglect tithing as an act of worship. In fact, Jesus said in the New Testament, when he's talking to tithers, man, give and it'll be given to you. Listen, this tests your father in heaven. You have a generous father. He'll give you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, pouring out into your lap. And here comes the scary line now. For with the measure you use, that's how the blessing of God is coming to you. 
Now, now look at this first because I'll tell you, this is one of the reasons we give as an act of worship. Jesus tells people who are tithers to give generously, which means there's a threshold for giving and 10% has been it through all of biblical history and giving generously means giving more than that. And I'll just tell you, Sarah and I have done that since the day we got married. Jesus promises that if you are generous with his causes on earth, he'll be more generous in blessing you. I mean, he just takes that promise that God made the Old Testament and carries it over into the New Testament. Just test me. Test me and see if you can be more generous with me than I can be with you. But then Jesus promises that he will be no more generous with you than you are with him. Your generosity will set the baseline for God's blessing in your life. And friends, listen. Jesus is why giving is a part of our worship every week. And can I just say personally, Jesus promising to bless me is not what motivates me. All he's got to do is ask. Now, I'm blessed, and I'm thankful to be blessed, no doubt about it. I'm the, I'm the richest man you will ever meet. But whether or not he blesses me because I give is just not a factor for me. Friends, for the one who saved me from hell, what could he ask that would be too much? Did you know that the word Savior is used 39 times in the Bible? 39 times we are reminded that Jesus and Jesus alone had the power and the will and the desire to save us. That is amazing grace. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, the word Lord, the word for the leader of your life, the authority of your life, do you know how many times that word is used in the Bible? 7,836 times. The idea is if you have a Savior, that person is going to be your Lord, right? And friends, that's why, you know, Sarah and I didn't quit tithing and quit giving to missions when she got cancer. And, and we had three little boys running around the house. Or when we submerged in debt afterwards because of all those uncovered medical costs. Or when our son was almost killed in a car wreck in high school and we submerged in medical debt again. Or when we had him in private Christian schools and private Christian colleges. We, we didn't quit giving, you know, when things just weren't going our way. Because honestly, none of that matters. I mean, if the Savior and leader of your life says, this is how I want you to worship me, then of course you're going to honor that. And if you don't, it says something pretty significant about who's actually leading your life. On the other hand, followers of Jesus give because we want God's full blessing and protection. Everybody say it with me, y'all. Full blessing and protection. Can I just share my testimony with you? When we were going through all those health issues and financial testing, friends, God showed up and blessed us over and over and over again. I mean, if you don't have any battles, you don't win any victories. Amen? Amen. And we had a lot of battles and we had a lot of victories. I'd love to tell you the story of how God enabled us to pay off all that medical debt. And it was slow and disciplined and relentless at first. And then it would just be these crazy accelerating events that enabled us to pay it off faster. I think because he just blessed our faithfulness. I'd love to tell you how his generosity you know, just caused joy to, to break out over our family, even in those financially tough times. It was like a joy broke over us like a wave in unexpected ways. I'm telling you, some of the most fun memories for our family are because of God's unpredictable, unexplainable blessing in our lives. And I think my son's hearts were shaped by watching God just show up in our life over and over and over again because we were faithful in this issue. Now, you know, we're doing this New Testament challenge right now where we're reading through the New Testament twice this week. We're just reading two chapters a day, uh, five days a week, and I'm putting the verse that hits me on Instagram, and a lot of people are following that post. You are. Appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, and if you, you read, want to read with me, just lock in. Start tomorrow on Acts 17 and 18. That's where we'll be. But I posted a, a picture on Instagram of Compassion College on Monday night. Uh, we have this first Monday of the night, great gathering of kind of 18 to 29-ish, you know, college students, young pros. They get together for, to worship the Lord and, and hear the word of God taught. And it's, it's pretty amazing. It happens the first Monday of every month. And one of my friends here at church saw that post and she wrote, I see my two kids there. I see my one there. Man, pray for God to work. Now, you know, when you're praying for God to use your church, to bless your family and save the eternal soul of somebody that you treasure. Man, don't you want to give? 
so that a ministry like that will thrive and be able to do stuff like Compassion College? And again, man, here's the counterintuitive thing about giving. When it gets real bad, or listen, y'all, when it gets real good, lots of people bail out on God. And they bail out on, on giving as an act of worship. And friends, I'm telling you, that's when you need God the most, when it's real bad and when it's real good. Because when it's real good, it can go from real good to real bad real fast. Can I hear amen? amen? And I'm telling you, the one time-tested way to attract the blessing of God is to obey him. And that's another reason why the church worships by giving every week. Because we know we need our Father's blessing and protection on our lives. And I'm not talking about bribing God. You can't bribe God. Friends, giving generously is about respect. You know, when you got a partner who's way up here and they love you and they're taking care of you and they're using their influence on your behalf and you know you could never pay for that, but you can respect it. And that's what giving does. In addition, followers of Jesus give because we love God's vision for our church. Everybody say it with me, y'all. God's vision... Did I start without you? Come on, here we go. God's vision for our church. Man, I, I want to be careful about this because I'm telling you, I've been to a couple churches in the past that were almost vision free. If you've ever been to a church like that, just say, mm-hmm. You know they're out there, man. You know the vision of that church is to have church next weekend. That's exciting. Or, or the, to, to let some little special interest group have their way all the time. And can I tell you, man, that is a sorry substitute for the audacious vision that the Lord Jesus has for his church. He told us what it was. He told his followers, go and make disciples of all nations. I'm not talking about just your backyard. I'm talking about everywhere. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Nothing in there is optional. Nothing. Nothing optional about Jesus' vision for his church. And I don't know about you, man, but I love it. Dude, I'm telling you, that is a mission I will gladly sacrifice for. Friends, that's why I love giving to a church like this. I love being a part of a church that will take risks so they can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and then ramp up systemic ways to help those new believers become fully devoted followers of Christ like Growth Track and then strategically deploy you know, those growing believers in ways that actually make a difference in our city and our country and our world. Man, I love giving to global outreach at our church. You know, that's how we do it. We give an addition to the tithe to global outreach. I love knowing that every day in Africa, there are 600 little school kids in one village whose families have been decimated by AIDS, kids that would be living hand to mouth or starve. But because we give, they eat a nourishing meal every day at our mission school in Mondoro in Zimbabwe. And they get an education so they can break the chains of poverty and part. Because God uses our gifts to make that happen. I love knowing that there are young men and women in China who are being rescued from inhumane orphan scenarios because they are disabled. Young men, have we got the picture of the Holloway family? Can we run that up for me? Uh, yeah. These are, these are folks right here from our church. This young man, this young man, this young man, adopted out of an orphanage where the conditions are so horrible that if your neighbor kept a dog like that, you would call the police. And yet these young men are growing up in a Christian home now because our church, our giving funded their, those parents to go over to China and rescue those kids from that situation. Man, I love knowing that there will be people in heaven, in India, in Africa, in Asia, and around the world because I signed up on our app to give every week whether I'm in town or not. Man, I just love giving to a church that has a fired up, organized, well understood, well executed, world changing vision. But that's not the only reason we give. Friends, you know, Christ followers give because we're an example to our children. Amen? Say it with me, everybody. We are an example to our children. You know, I remember when my son Cam and Trip Coggins and Ashley Lloyd and a bunch of these kids were about four years old. Every Sunday they'd be in children's church and they'd take up an offering. And their teacher is a guy named Jimmy Carter. You've probably heard of him. Not the president of the United States. All right? Uh, he's another one. But they take up that offering, and then he'd take it out of the classroom, go down the hallway, take it to the Sunday school office or wherever it was. And then every week they'd tell those kids, we're giving this money for Jesus. And so one day when Jimmy left to take the offering down, you know, down the hallway, Cam got up and followed him out to the room. And Jimmy said, you need to go back in the room. And he said, mm -hmm, I'm coming with you. And Jimmy says, why? He said, we're giving this to Jesus, right? And he said, yes, sir. 
He said, well, I want to see you give them to him. <laughs> I mean, apparently, there was something compelling about Mr. Jimmy's offering talk every week. And Cam thought, he's taking that money down to Jesus right now. I want to see that. But you know, I'm telling you, an example is a powerful thing. I, I stand before you today to bless my mother, who was an example of giving to me. Uh, sadly, my mom became a widow and a single mother at 36 years of age. She taught in a little public school that didn't make much money, taught piano in the afternoons to make ends meet. But I learned to be generous by watching her write that tithe check every Sunday morning and fold it and hand it to me to drop in the offering plate while she played the piano for our church. That woman built a noble legacy and handed it to me. And I want to do the same thing. I want to leave my family that legacy because I'll tell you one day, probably right here in this room, my boys are going to be at my funeral and they're probably going to say something. They're probably going to have to apologize because let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff I did not do right. I said stuff from the pulpit sometimes that they were not appreciative of. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I think if they're honest, they're going to say, listen, our dad did not get it all right. I mean, in spite of this and in spite of that and in spite of that, let me tell you, he had a generous heart. Our dad was a giver. And I want them to see that because we are all an example, good or bad. They watching us all the time. Amen. And I know my father in heaven is generous because I've seen his example. And I hope my family will see that in me as well. And then they'll be that for my grandchildren. Finally, we give because we want to make God proud. Say it with me, everybody. We want to make God proud of us. You know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the believers in the city of Corinth about how important giving is in the life of the church. And Paul told these folks, he said, listen, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, they did something that proved the integrity of their faith. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men are going to praise God for your generosity in sharing with them and with everybody else. Man, what was the service that proved something about their faith? They were generous in their giving. And you can't fake that. There's a lot of stuff you can fake about the Christian life for a little while, but you can't fake generosity. Paul says, long after we're with the Lord, men are still going to be praising God because of the impact of our generosity. And I think that's awesome. I, I, I'm pretty much looking forward to getting to heaven and meeting people from other parts of the world who got saved because of our generosity here in, in Savannah and Statesboro and Midway and Rankin and all that. I mean, can you imagine somebody walking up to you in heaven saying, did you go to Compassion Christian? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course I did. We're here at the middle gate on the south side. This is where our church rolls, right here. What you doing here? Of course, this is, yeah, yeah, I went to Compassion Christian. Well, I lived in Thailand. And somebody from your church moved to our city. And they rescued me from slavery and led me to Jesus. And I'm here because your church sent them there. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. And I think that will be cool. But let me tell you, for me, the bottom line is not what people think. I want my Father in heaven to be proud of me. I mean, I, when I see my father in heaven, I want to hear him say, Cam, welcome home, son. Well done. I mean, I want him to look at me like that son that exceeded his expectations. I want to be that boy that did more than expected. I want my heavenly father to throw an arm around me the day I get to heaven and say, hey, everybody, look who's home with joy in his eyes. Dude, I don't want to have to back into heaven embarrassed like some spiritual wimp who spent his whole life calculating the minimum requirement to get by. Man, I want my father to be proud of me. I want him to say, Cam, you have a generous heart just like me. You care for the weak and the hurting in your world just like I do. You made a difference in this world and I'm proud of you. Way to go. And friends, that's why if you're a follower of Jesus, giving is a holy thing. It's a holy thing. And that's why I am meticulous about what I give and how I give and where I give. Man, I've tried to tithe and give beyond that faithfully my whole Christian life. And I intend to be faithful and growing in this holy calling until the day I die and beyond. 
And I'm telling you, when I am dead and in heaven and my will is executed, my last gift to God will hit the books while I'm standing right in front of the Lord Jesus. And so will yours. I'm telling you, generosity is a powerful, life-changing, God-like thing. It's a family trait. And now, if anybody asks you why we give every week, you know lots of reasons why we do that. Friends, giving is a life-changing act of worship that blesses us, it blesses our world, and it brings glory to our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity we've had today to think about something that you know, some of us have been doing every week of our lives. Our parents taught us to bring nickels and dimes to church or so that uh, we could give 10% of our allowance when we were little kids, birthday money. And then from there, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And Father, we're thankful for that. We're thankful, Lord, that we were taught. Others of us have heard this message for the first time today. We, we ain't never heard this before. It sounds like it's from Mars or something. But I pray, God, that they will stay around long enough to appreciate all that you have given to them. And then, Lord, it will become a joy for them to give back. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' strong name and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Amen.